根据研调机构顾能的统计， 2 0 2 4年全球半导体总营收达到 6,260 亿美元，相较2023年大幅成长 18.1% 其中，三星电子以665亿美元的营收成绩打败英特尔跟辉达，成为前十大半导体供应商龙头。至于全球十大晶圆代工业者，在二零二四年的合计营收也有成长，达到三百八十四点八亿美元的好成绩。而这阵子，当美国宣布加码，豪掷一千亿美元投资的台积电，则依然稳坐全球晶圆代工业龙头宝座，以市占率百分之六十七，遥遥领先三星电子跟中芯国际。而在理解台积电为什么会成为川普布局半导体事业里最重要的一块拼图时，我们必须先听听各方对这块市场的看法。About Amazon, they are going to spend seventy-five billion dollars, and according to the CEO, mostly on ramping up、uh, Gen AI. This tells me that twenty twenty-five should be another very good year for the large language model builders and the semiconductor companies like Nvidia that support them. We always thought that.、Uh, Gen AI and other aspects of AI would be a big deal over time, but the next year, more building of these models, a lot of infrastructure. 日本に製造装置メーカーもありますし、えー、たくさんのマテリアルのメーカーもあります。えー、まあこの2ナノのチャレンジっていうのもありますが、新たにパッケージングのような取り組みもされるというふうに聞いてますし、えー、まあ設計上もいろいろと変えると。回路設計ですね。もういろいろと変えるというふうに聞いていますので、そういう意味では我々にとっても新たなビジネス領域が開けるオプチュニティかなというふうには考えています。There's a Chinese startup that few people had ever heard of until the past few days, and it has emerged as a real player in the AI arms race. It's called Deep Seek. It's only been around for a bit, but DeepSeek has already vaulted to the top of the App Store on Apple as the most downloaded app, passing ChatGPT, which is pretty shocking. DeepSeek says that their AI model only cost 5.6 million dollars. Now we don't know that, but if that's true, that is pretty stunning. Anthropic, one of the leading AI companies, has said that it costs about 100 million to 1. Billion dollars to develop an AI model. We know that Mark Zuckerberg, the Meta CEO, says that his company plans to spend 65 billion dollars on AI. So, John, look, this is all really questioning sort of the foundation here of the AI boom, which is that it requires a lot of spending, which is that the U.S. is running away with the AI arms race, and it's also Questioning some of the big positives that had pushed markets to record highs. ChatGPT came along and disrupted the entire internet's business model. Now its owner, OpenAI, is looking to disrupt the semiconductor space as well. The company, according to Reuters, is getting closer to creating its own in-house custom AI chip. So I think、uh, something that I'm very passionate about is semiconductor industry growth. And、uh, you know, Handel Jones, a good friend of mine, he recommended. You know, He kind of pre predicted 2030,、uh, it will be a one trillion dollars、um, um, industry, and、uh, I think、uh, he underestimated. You know, it will drive the electronic sy system、uh, to three trillion dollars, and that's five big、uh, generative drivers:、uh, 5G, hyperscale computing, AI, and autonomous driving, and also industrial IoT. And I still remember I backed Annapurna Lab before I sold it to AWS, and it became, you know, the graviton and uh, and uh, fantastic, uh, uh, almost top ten customer of TSMC. 目前，部分投资人对于半导体市场融景保持观望态度。一部分的原因，除了是受到川普总统反反复复的关税政策影响。还有一部分是受到汽车、电脑、智慧手机的需求不振所引起。虽然短期的波动无法避免，但是方向是不变的。未来赚钱的事业依然会围绕科技打转，而尖端技术的发展，关键无疑还是在半导体。There's a lot here that markets are grappling with. What would you say is really driving this negativity we're seeing in tech stocks? I mean, the key word that jumps out to me in Caroline's comments is just anxiety. We're seeing so much anxiety, of course, around the tech narrative and the, that 
began with DeepSeek and has continued as we continue to see competition coming out of China, but it's also related to the tariff question. And I think when we're thinking about tariffs, we have to acknowledge the fact that this is an area, you know, AI generally, where there's a lot of emphasis on US becoming a superpower. And so that should have some insulation when we think about how the Trump administration is going to approach the semiconductor space and the technology space broadly. At the same time, there's a lot of rumblings around the types of tariffs that we could see on semiconductors, real pressure to build here in the US. And I think when we think about all of these different anxieties from questions on global competition to questions around tariffs, we have to remember the context that we're in and the valuations that we saw at the start of the year. There was just no room for disappointment or uncertainty. I still very much believe in the whole data center build out. I still very much believe in the grid upgrade, and we haven't spent money on the grid in over 50 years, incremental uh, money at least. I still think that's going to be powered by AI, so AI, data center, grid, and then power overall. Those are the themes that I like very much. When you say that you still believe in the AI story, yeah. in, in the beginning part of 2000, you could say, well, I really believe in the internet story and when you had in May of 2000 I guess when you had the crash you could say well I still believe in the AI story and the stocks continued to go lower because they went up in such a ridiculous fashion that it just wasn't justified. Well the companies weren't earning anything that that's the difference companies are earning and we talked about this last week Broadcom that was the best semiconductor company and absolutely focusing on AI I know it's a diversified company but AI is exactly what they thought it was going to be a uh, total addressable market or a serviceable addressable market of 60 to 80 billion dollars between now and 2027 and they are signing up custom ASIC customers more than people thought. And so if they're if they're doing that, AI still is very much in the early innings. And Together, these world-leading technology giants are announcing the formation of Stargate. So put that name down in your books, because I think you're going to hear a lot about it in the future. A new American company that will invest $500 billion at least in AI infrastructure in the United States and move, and very, very quickly moving very rapidly, creating over 100,000 American jobs almost immediately. According to a report by the India Electronics and Semiconductor Association, the global manufacturing supply chain is expected to nearly double to $420 billion by 2030. The report has also highlighted that while India's semiconductor journey is at a nascent stage, Global majors, including Micron, have tied up with Indian companies to boost their presence in India and prop up India's semicon journey. India will also require approximately 1.5 million skilled workers and 5 million semi-skilled workers across the value chain by 2027 to achieve its semiconductor goals. We have always wanted to move from the back end, um, which is on uh, testing and assembly, to the front end, where in terms of the value, the back end only captures about 10 to 15 percent of the value of the supply chain, whereas 60 percent is more or less at the front end. Uh, but it's a lot more difficult because obviously it involves IPs. And if we were to wait for our own expertise to develop organically, most probably it's going to take much longer. So the government has taken um, a radical approach where we work with ARM, uh, which is a market leader in IP architecture, uh, with the perspective of building the whole ecosystem, and that will be able to complement our strength in back end, and then we'll accelerate our move towards the front end. Well, TSMC produces for, for everyone. They're sort of the, the producer of record for the industry right now. But what's really interesting in the results uh, and they're guiding revenue up about 25% next year. About 60% of that growth is coming from AI. And after oh, yeah. the AI revenue tripling uh, in 24, they expect to double again uh, this year, which is really a good summary of what's going on in chips right now, which is AI is just driving the bus right now. That's where the growth is. And everything else is just kind of middling right now. Uh, and it's been really uh, interesting because we're sort of in the third year and, and outside of AI, so in, in, in a bit of a, a, a 
downturn in, in the semiconductor industry, given the, in the inventory that was built up during the pandemic. And by now, you would think that the rest of the business, PCs, handsets, traditional servers, you know, other stuff would be stronger, but it's just not. And, uh, you know, it's, we, we lowered numbers on a couple of companies, you know, going into earnings uh, uh, last uh, earlier this week. A and it's just been really interesting that everything outside of AI is just just kind of OK. Uh, and yeah. AI is really driving everything. 虽然股市是行业表现的领先指标，虽然目前美国的股市表现并不理想，但是朝人工智能发展的路线并没有受到剧烈修正，对高阶晶片的需求一直摆在眼前。即便低成本的 AI 模型 DeepSeek 的崛起为市场投入震撼弹，但这也只是显示门槛降低，需求只会放大。曾经有人以张忠谋先生力抗苹果，要求台积电扩产的往事来类比今日台积电赴美设厂，其实是没有看到两件事情背后的差异。当年苹果预期市场销售量能会放大，所以要求台积电为其扩产。但是苹果的预期终究与现实有落差。反观今日全球朝人工智能发展路线已经确认，而人工智能的核心就是高阶晶片。当辉达收到客户订单，转而对代工厂台积电下单，台积电在看得到的量能底下去做全球扩张的布局，其实是为已确认的产能做冲刺。而至于之前市场传出的，美国希望台积电跟博通可以接手经营英特尔一事，对台积电也不全是无利可图。英特尔在过去曾是半导体霸主，这绝非浪得虚名。尤其英特尔为市场练就的新武功，如果一切顺利，在今年可以推出 1.8 纳米的制程，在2026年可以推 1.4 纳米制程，然后2027年再跃升至1纳米制程。那么，台积电跟英特尔的合作就是一场强强联手的好生意。Uh, you know, I think the the they're on track to probably to beat their previous guidance, and also that they gave for the fourth quarter, and even for their first quarter, I think you know we'll continue to see some upside, despite there has been some head noises,、uh, headwinds about supply side issues,、uh, but we expect that they will still. Probably continue to surprise, and in fact, DeepSeek is a near-term positive because we've also seen that、uh, there's been very strong for their H20 chip coming out of China over the last couple of weeks. So that could also provide some uplift into the upcoming quarter. It, it's drubbing at the end of last year. It just made me think. You know, look, there's more value in this name than anybody is recognizing at this point, and maybe. Maybe just maybe Pat Gelsinger saying, "Hey, we're going to be a foundry." Made people look and say, "Look at all those foundry assets that they have," and he was not able to turn this company around in the time and the way he wanted. But I think it is a vestige of his past that now, of all places, TSMC is looking, going, "Hey, maybe we can make、uh, something out of this company by adding their expertise." To the foundries, and I think that is the most exciting thing. Everyone knows their foundry business is burning a lot of cash. It lost seven billion dollars、uh, last year, and、uh, there's no signs of you know the business turning around anytime soon. So what they've done is created an independent subsidiary for that business.、Uh, obviously, they need more funding to upgrade the you know the fabs to make sure it can compete with TSMC. But at least there's more transparency around how much money they are losing in that foundry business, what sort of gross margin profile it has, and it just as an investor, it gives me more comfort to see okay how is the core PC business doing versus what is it that the foundry is losing, and you know if they have to raise capital then they can do that. So more to do with transparency. I don't think execution changes in a quarter,、yep. so it's it's a long story. But at least they're doubling down in the U.S. here. So they're stopping their investments outside of U.S., and what it suggests is, that with the geopolitical tensions that there are, a lot of these hyperscalers will pivot to using Intel as a foundry, at least here in the U.S. Shares of Intel rose as much as seven percent on Wednesday, following a Reuters report that Taiwanese chipmaking giant TSMC 
has pitched several U.S. chip designers on taking stakes in a joint venture that would operate struggling Intel factories. Four sources tell Reuters that NVIDIA, Advanced Micro Devices, and Broadcom have been approached about the plan, which would have TSMC run the operations of Intel's foundry division, which makes chips adapted for the needs of customers, but it would not own more than 50 percent. So I should mm -hmm. say they've been searching for a CEO. They found Lip Bhutan. Um, he's no stranger. He's, you know, he's a tech investor. He's worked at Cadence Design, which is a chip automation software firm. Uh, he used to be on Intel's board, but stepped down back in August. Rumors were that he clashed with former CEO Pat Gelsinger. Uh, so now he's back. The current or the co-CEOs, you have David Zisner. He's going to keep at it at CF, as CFO. And then Michelle Holthouse will remain the CEO of Intel products. But I guess that's one one bright spot for Intel, given the other issues. They've had product delays with uh, their AI chip. Uh, we know the, the spending. I think they're burning through about $25 billion a year on the foundry business. And then competition. They're losing, you know, continued market share to AMD and even to the likes of uh, NVIDIA at this point. Uh, we think Libbu brings a very uh, fresh outsider's perspective uh, to the company. Uh, there's a lot of uh, challenges uh, ahead of them in trying to design the right strategy uh, for their manufacturing group, for their uh, product uh, pipeline. You know, there still is no AI pipeline uh, for the company. The manufacturing side is, is behind. But we think what Libbu brings uh, to the table is a very kind of breadth of expertise around the design side, uh, right? He has worked well with foundries. He was at Cadence Design Systems, uh, so he knows how to work with external uh, tools at Cadence. He did a lot of uh, restructuring, so I think he brings the right level of experience, knowledge, respect, and relationships across uh, the supply chain. Uh, but we do think, you know, turnarounds don't happen uh, overnight. Uh, it takes a while uh, for uh, really managing something that is so asset heavy. So we we just think it, it's a matter of time, but this is a very strong move uh, by, uh, by Intel's board.